Well, hello, friends. Hello, H3O. We are live now on Facebook. Welcome to our H3O gathering online this evening. It is me, Lyndall, and I'm joined by Alex here tonight hey. and Brooke, of course, who we'll introduce in a moment. Um, welcome. I Oh. That is on. I'm listening to myself, <laughs> echoing, getting very, very confused. <laughs> but welcome to tonight. Welcome from wherever you are. Sure, um, so smooth, isn't it? <laughs> wherever you're beaming in from. I believe we have a watch party at Drew Central as well that's that's joining us. Um, so very well, very warm welcome to you guys as well. Um, tonight we are continuing um, in our on our journey together as a community um, which we're calling change the heart borrowing that language from common grace the journey that we have started together since the beginning of the year journey of learning and of listening of growing together um, and leaning leaning into Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander justice um, and culture and tonight we are joined again by Brooke and we're really delighted to be joined again um, by Brooke to help us to continue that journey together and to um, learn together essentially. Ooh. Yeah. And could we encourage you if you haven't already, because I always forget to do this, I plan to do it every week and I always forget. Could we encourage you if you're tuning in now, um, why not share this? That just immediately opens up a whole new group of people who will um, access tonight's content and it's going to be great. Brooke, Brooke is going to bring us some wisdom gems. So um, do share it, get it out there, share it with your friends. And um, yeah, we'd love you to do that. And do keep commenting. So all the way through this evening, um, we would love to be responding to what you're saying. So comment below, add your questions, add your reflections, and we will try and reflect them into the conversation as much as we can. Mm. That's the plan. Yeah, perfect. So I did share a little bit this morning um, about my connection to Brooke and my relationship with Brooke, and I'll do that a little bit again now. Um, my first connection with Brooke was through my own family and through my brother, who um, who um, is, is a good friend of Brooke's as well, and was a part of one of the, well, the original um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander justice team in the early days of Common Grace. Um, so I learnt of Brooke through him, um, and then started following her and listening to her from afar. And then it wasn't until a couple of years ago that um, I was lucky enough to. Um, here Brooke in person um, as I was uh, still am studying at Malling Theological College and I was doing a subject on church history and Brooke and Auntie Jean Phillips were invited in to share with us around Australian church history um, which was just um, such a significant moment for me and it was mind-blowing for me and so challenging for me and especially Auntie Jean Phillips words around the call to the church and the call to followers of Jesus to um, embrace reconciliation and embrace friendship in reconciliation and to walk with. Um, and so it was that moment after that class that I went up and introduced myself to Brooke and um, we had a chat. And so I am delighted to have her with us again this evening. And I might hand over to you now, Brooke, to introduce yourself actually um, to us um, now. Yeah, thanks so much. Uh, it's wonderful to be here with you uh, tonight. Uh, and having joined this morning as well. So uh, thank you for that introduction, Lyndall. I love it when uh, we, relationship is so important to Aboriginal peoples, as I said this morning as well, but to get introduced through relationship uh, and through those memories in a way uh, is really important and really special. So thank you for that. Uh, and yeah, so a bit about me. Uh, I am a Waka Waka woman, uh, Waka Waka uh, my Aboriginality comes through my maternal lines um, and that's my mum, back to my mum's mum, my nan, back to my nan's mum, my great-grandmother uh, from Waka Waka country, which is uh, a nation in uh, the lands now called Southeast Queensland. Uh, and uh, yes, when I was uh, with your brother Shane in the original Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander justice team for Common Grace, uh, I was the Aboriginal spokesperson and now get to serve as the CEO of Common Grace. And um, it's actually a really special appointment because it's the first time an Aboriginal person has been the CEO or national leader of a national Christian organisation mm -hmm. uh, in Australia. So it took us until 2020 to get there. 
in Australia with a Christian organization. Um, but I'm grateful to pave the way for others to come through, uh, having broken that first, uh, in a way. So, uh, yeah, but a couple of other things people might not realize I'm actually a chartered accountant, one of only 22 indigenous chartered accountants in all of Australia. I've now completed my graduate diploma in theology through NAITS. Uh, we set up, uh, there's a global Indigenous institute called NAITS, uh, Theological Institute, focused at the master's and PhD level. And so I'm part of the founding board of that, along with uh, Uncle Pastor Ray Minicon uh, for the Australian expression of that. So it took us many years to get that established here in Australia, but we have. Uh, and yeah, so they're just a few things about me. Mm. it's so good to have you just to say so many people are already saying they're grateful for this morning so glad to be tuning in again tonight and um, looking forward to hearing more gold so no pressure Brooke <laughs> but we are we're just thrilled to have you with us yeah yeah, yeah hearing about your experience and um yeah and 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 your perspective I think it's such a privilege to be able to hear from you tonight as well um, and we, uh, as we do as H3O, um, and I recognise that it's important to acknowledge country and the country that we're gathering on today, I'm going to invite Brooke to um, do that for us this evening. Yeah, it's a real honour and privilege to acknowledge country together tonight. Uh, so as is my way, uh, as we enter acknowledgement of country, for me, uh, it is to remember that we are visitors to these lands, unless you're a local Aboriginal person from the lands upon uh, which you are sitting tonight. Uh, we are all visitors. And so we take that posture as visitor, as guest, uh, and what that means to listen deeply, uh, to connect, to learn. Uh, and so uh, acknowledgements of country are based in our ancient cultural practices. These aren't uh, new ideas. Uh, as we would travel through other people's nations, we would be welcomed to country, and that's where welcome to country comes today. And acknowledgement of country is an offshoot of that. And so uh, I announce myself on the lands upon which I am uh, here tonight. I'm a Waka Waka woman. Uh, who was born on the lands of the Yindinji peoples, uh, who grew up and until 18 months ago resided on the lands of the Gubby Gubby peoples. And that is where I am physically located tonight, on the lands of the Gubby Gubby peoples. Uh, but I now uh, also live on the lands of the Gadigal peoples. And so I announce myself on country tonight. And uh, together, as we gather across these lands now called Australia and the lands upon which you sit and listen tonight, we acknowledge the traditional custodians of those lands. This moment of being able to meet virtually right across these lands now called Australia gives us the beautiful opportunity to actually think, uh, respect, acknowledge and honour the over 300 nations of Aboriginal peoples right across these lands now called Australia. Uh, and people might want to put in the comments uh, tonight to acknowledge whose lands uh, you are meeting on tonight. Uh, and also to extend yourself. If you were born in these lands now called Australia, put in the comments if you know uh, which Aboriginal nation you were born on. And if you were born not on these lands now called Australia, uh, to, to comment about that as well. But as we come together to acknowledge country, we know that country is not just land and it's not just peoples. Country is all lands, waters, sky, trees, plants, birds, animals, fish, mountains, rivers, seas, uh, rocks, and all peoples. And so on the lands upon which we meet tonight, we acknowledge those traditional custodians who have been and continue to be stewards on behalf of the almighty creator, stewards and caretakers since time immemorial. And we pay our respects to the elders past, present and future. And when we pay our respects, what I am saying is I respect I honour those elders and it's actually a deep thank you to them because for those elders that I'm acknowledging, especially of the past uh, and the present, they have fought for equality, for freedom, for justice and for love so that I am able to be here tonight in this position to be able to speak uh, with H3O uh, and more broadly as well. And so it is a deep thank you to those elders and the elders of the present 
who continue to refresh, revitalise and maintain culture. Such an important thing, especially as we think about NAIDOC week uh, this week and again in November when we'll think about NAIDOC week. And as we celebrate, uh, always was, always will be, uh, we take that posture of acknowledgement of the traditional custodians and paying our respects to the elders. Uh, and we come together tonight on country. We do acknowledge the distance in relationship between Aboriginal peoples and non-Aboriginal peoples. And so that may that be a prayer, a blessing and a challenge for us uh, as we draw closer in relationship uh, right across these lands now called Australia. Thank you, Brooke. Um, just to frame up where we're heading tonight, um, which really follows on from that beautiful acknowledgement of country that Brooke's just um, provided for us, not only the acknowledgement, but the, the, learn, the teaching within that. You've, you've given so much um, that we can listen to in that too, Brooke which um, will lead us into where we're heading tonight as well. Um, you know, this really is a space to continue the journey together, as I said at the beginning, together as a community, to learn and to listen together. Um, and we really want to create um, a space of safety um, for us to be able to learn together. Um, we need to be able to be curious. Um, we talk about wondering a lot at HCRO to wonder and to be able to be brave and ask those questions that we're that um, that spark our curiosity. Um, so we do really encourage you to ask those questions. I know for myself at times I have felt um, the thing that blocks me is the the um, being worried about saying it wrong or um, using the wrong words or not getting it right. Um, but we do encourage you tonight to just um, to lean into that and just just ask and that this is a space of graciousness. Um, and we take these, we take questions in a, in the spirit of learning. And I know, Brooke, that you that you've said that to us. That um, you, there's no question that you haven't heard, <laughs> perhaps. <laughs> um, and so your questions are really welcomed, and we encourage that throughout tonight. Um, I don't know if there's anything else you need to add to that. Mm. Brooke, you you had a little comment on that, didn't you? About oh, just the um, that's right. Yeah, chip in, chip in. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um, uh. You know, I have heard many questions over the last 10 years of my Aboriginal Christian leadership journey. And uh, part of what I say is that we have to open up the conversation. Uh, and so uh, it's best to do that with an Aboriginal person. And so people have an amazing opportunity tonight. If there's a question you've ever wanted um, to ask, you can send it anonymously as well, I'm quite sure. Uh, but uh, I'm very happy to answer questions and take those in the spirit of learning and of conversation and continued conversation. And uh, as I reflect over the last kind of three weeks, as Black Lives Matter around the globe has uh, shone a light on systemic racism and we've started having that conversation in these lands now called Australia. Uh, I've seen some people taking scholarship out of the United States of America and they're like don't burden Aboriginal people with your questions and there is an element of that but uh, now is not the time to be just talking amongst non-Indigenous people and forgetting your Aboriginal friends uh, mm -hmm. as well. So there is plenty that you can learn, but one of the best ways that you can learn is by sitting at the feet of Aboriginal peoples and actually listening uh, to us and, and being in conversation with us. And so that's what we've got here tonight. It's a perfect opportunity to do that. So please do think of your questions and, and send them through. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Absolutely. Okay, so without um, further ado, I am going to hand over to Brooke now, who's going to speak to us for a little while. And as as we've already said, please do keep sending your questions in, and we'll kind of um, bring those in as they as it as it feels right in in the point of the conversation. Um, but Brooke, I'm going to hand over to you now. Uh, thank you so much. And so. Uh, if you did tune in this morning, this is different uh, to what was shared this morning, but I think a great complement um, to what was shared this morning. So if you haven't watched this morning, I do encourage you to go back uh, and, and watch that as well. I'm, I'm hoping it's available. Uh, and what I'm sharing tonight uh, is a, a message that I developed and I'm hoping that it sparks um, that curiosity, that wonder for you and will help to generate some questions. Uh, uh, so let me share with us tonight. 
the power of we is in me, in you, and in us. The power of we starts with me. If it is to be, it is up to me. These are 10 two-letter words. And I first came across this phrase when I was 18 years old. And so I've journeyed with these 20 letters for just over 20 years now. And this phrase has helped me achieve impossible dreams. It's taught me to listen and to learn. And it's also taught me that change starts with me. And it's a me that is a waka waka woman. It's a me that is a daughter, an older sister, an aunt. It's a me that is the first person in my family to go to university. It's a me that is one of a handful of post-grad qualified Aboriginal chartered accountants. It's a me that is a writer, a speaker, an advocate and a pastor. It's a me that is a follower of Jesus. It's a me that is a neighbour. It's the me that reaches out a hand of friendship to you. And that's when the power of we then extends to you. The power of we means taking action, action that takes me and you out of our own homes to our neighbour, to see each other, to form community and then to walk alongside each other. The power of we then becomes us. But for the power of we to truly be powerful, we must understand us. The us is in diversity and not uniformity. When uniformity is sought, it is the dominant culture who decides who is in and who is out. And there can be no unity without diversity. The us is not Australia. Well, it's not Australia as it currently is. When the us is Australia, often it is the Aboriginal peoples who are missing, excluded, or somehow we become invisible. Australians all let us rejoice for we are young and free. How does over 65,000 years of connection, family and story make me young? How does 100% of young people in Northern Territory detention centres being Aboriginal make me free? My only conclusion is that I am not part of this us or the we of this Australia. If the us is this Australia, do we realise, do we realise that this Australia locks up 10-year-old Aboriginal children? This Australia doesn't implement recommendations to stop Aboriginal people dying in custody. This Australia says sorry and then continues to remove children from their families. This Australia talks about closing the gap for over 10 years and then ceases transport services for dialysis patients, forcing a double amputee to catch public transport. This Australia celebrates Aboriginal peoples at things like the Gama Festival and then wants to frack their land as they protest no. This Australia proposes a $50 million monument to Captain Cook when one already exists. This Australia wants to bulldoze sacred birthing trees for a road and wants to reduce the status of a national park to a state forest so that it can log ancient trees. This Australia blows up 46,000-year-old sacred sites. This Australia protects a statue that tells a lie with 600 police officers surrounding it, but a woman fleeing domestic and family violence can call police multiple times and no one ever comes. This Australia does not listen to or learn from Aboriginal peoples. Does the we that is this Australia actually care? This we for far too long has sounded like assimilation, protection, advancement. This we sounds like uniformity, fear and inferiority. It's a we bound up in rhetorical values like the Australian values described by a former Prime Minister as freedom, democracy, mateship, a fair go, mutual respect, the equality of men and women and the rule of law. The power of we knows these Australian values are only for some and not for all. But imagine, 
Imagine if it was a different we, a we that includes you, that celebrates that we have the world's oldest living continuing cultures, a we that includes you, that knows that these lands now called Australia were the most sophisticated societies the world has ever seen in 300 nations of peoples coexisting in harmony for over 65,000 years, living sustainably from the lands and waters, from what Creator had provided. A we that not only says, but actually does love their neighbour as themselves, their people neighbour, tree neighbour, animal neighbour, bird neighbour, fish neighbour, mountain neighbour, water neighbour, land neighbour, sky neighbour, loves their earth neighbour. A we that builds the kingdom of heaven here on earth. A we that says, as it does in Revelation 21, 3 and 4, he will wipe every tear from our eyes, where together we shout, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with us. But this shouting of we is not some distant time in the future, stuck in revelation or stuck until the return of Jesus. It is now. The power of we is all of us. The we is how the creator designed us. The we is how Aboriginal people see, hear, feel and be. The we is knowing all things are connected. The Naranjeri peoples are incredible weavers and Aunty Ellen Trevorrow from the Naranjeri peoples who comes from over 2,500 generations of weavers, she says, stitch by stitch, circle by circle, weaving is like the creation of life. All things are connected. In Colossians 2 in the message it says, I want you woven into a tapestry of love in touch with everything there is to know of God. As Aboriginal peoples, we know this tapestry. It's the tapestry of community. It's the tapestry of heaven and earth, land and sky, seas and rivers, animals and birds, tree and flower, reef and rainforest, desert and lake. It's the tapestry that is not Aboriginal but is Waka Waka, Gubby Gubby, Wiradjuri, Wurundjeri, Wutiti, Anunu, Wolpuri, Ghana, Wajuk, Kamilaroi, Ngunnawal. It's the tapestry that is English, Dutch, Scottish, Irish, German, Chinese, Greek, Italian, Vietnamese, Sudanese, Syrian. It's a tapestry that is man, woman, young, old, and of all varying abilities. It's a tapestry that uses the threads of every colour of the rainbow. It's a tapestry that uses ancient threads, new threads, and even manages to weave together broken threads. The tapestry is the creator's. And the creator didn't just knit me in my mother's womb, but he knitted you and you and you and you. And then the creator wove us together. The power of we is in the weaving. It's a new tapestry, one that looks more like treaties than recognition, more like conciliation than reconciliation, more like friend than problem and issue. If it is to be, it is up to me. But imagine the impact if we came together in the power of we. Someone once told me to remember that we are only one truth, one story, one reframe away from clearly seeing our place in the struggle, the path before us and the call on our heart. And the call on my heart is love. Love of a man named Jesus, who through love challenged the rich and powerful. Love of a man named Jesus, who through love walked beside the lost, the last and the least. Love of a man named Jesus who, in partnership and equality with the Creator and Holy Spirit, created all things since time immemorial, who placed Aboriginal peoples in these lands now called Australia since time immemorial, and who has been calling us, that's all of us, who has been calling us to be transformed by the renewing of our minds, 
requiring us to act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly, whilst commanding us to love the Lord our God with all our heart and with all our soul and with all our mind and with all our strength and to love our neighbour as ourself. Creator Spirit, Lord God, Papa, Jesus, they are the power of we, me, you, us. Thank you. Thanks, Brooke. That was amazing. Thank you. Mm. If you're just joining us now, we are diving right in with the wonderful Brooke Prentice. Um, and we are, we're really exploring Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander justice and what that looks like and how we can lean into that as a, as a church community. So to join the conversation, comment below, ask your questions. Tonight is a great chance to do that. And we've had loads of comments coming mm. in already. Um, almost just to just to, yeah just to thank you Brooke and to encourage you and um, people really loving the image of tapestry finding that a really helpful image um, weaving together says Rhonda and um, Phil's finding, finding it hard to separate any separate any kind of part of what you're saying because everything just feels really sobering and really powerful and perhaps it just needs a bit of time just to sit but thank you Phil um, LT Hopper says thank you um, and, and, and really, again, just a, a reminder of something you said this morning to us, but um, Lauren um, commenting on this idea of the oldest living continuing culture, just something to be so proud of, something that should be celebrated. And that was something that came out this morning too. So, so thank you, lots of comments. Keep them coming. If you have questions, bring them, bring them to us. Mm. So I'm just so many, um... Kind of feelings I'm feeling I think uh, parts of what you were saying um, at the beginning there I, you know I find myself holding back tears at the thought of um, I guess yeah when you when you speak into things like closing the gap um, and things um, speaking about Aboriginal children as young as 10 that are, are in custody and we think about Aboriginal deaths in custody and um, I know for me, it's this sense of um, all the feelings that come up, the devastation, the sadness, the, the anger, um, and then it's the feelings of helplessness of where, where do I go? What do I do? Where do I look? I wonder if you can speak into that a little bit, Brooke, and, and I guess that brings in common grace as well um, and speaking about what common grace do and, and yeah, maybe if I'll take you about that. Yeah, I, I think probably where I start is with those feelings. Um, another thing I often talk about is being unsettled and that Jesus is the great unsettler. And I have a theological paper called Learning to be Guests of Ancient Hosts on Ancient Lands um, that I co-wrote with Major uh, Sandra McLean. And uh at the end of that, I talk about Jesus, the great unsettler, and obviously it's a play on the word settler, invader, etc. Um, so capital U N dash capital S settler. Uh, but for me, um, not just as an Aboriginal person, but as a Christian, uh, it's Jesus that unsettles me in heart, mind, and spirit each and every day. Uh, and so when you have those feelings of unsettledness, for me, that's a good thing. And to tune into those uh, and to include Jesus in that because he's the one doing the unsettling uh, and calling us to action, um, which can be listening, learning, uh, walking, uh, actually taking action. So in Aboriginal deaths in custody with Common Grace, and I, I think you guys will share this um, this week uh, about the actions we've been calling people to take for Aboriginal deaths in custody to, you know, it's been since 1991, we've had 339 recommendations and only a handful have ever been implemented uh, and they could prevent deaths. Uh, and so I think sometimes it is easy to get overwhelmed by the amount of injustice because when you start to listen and when um, you start to see, uh, you can't unsee and then you see next issue after next issue after next issue. But these aren't just Aboriginal issues. These are things, injustices that are affecting real people's lives. Behind every statistic uh, of disadvantage facing Aboriginal peoples, these are real peoples. 
these are my my aunts, my uncles, my cousins, my nieces, my nephews. Uh, you know, it, it's our family. Uh, this is what is behind every single statistic. And so, you know, what I've had to wrestle with in the last three, four weeks during this Black Lives Matter moment uh, is part of the fact that as Aboriginal peoples, we are only 2.8% of the Australian population. We were once 100% of the Australian population. Sometimes we just need to sit with that. And our population levels today in 2020 have still not recovered to what they were pre-colonisation. So today we sit at about 600,000 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples across Australia. Um, Pre-colonisation, it was estimated over a million peoples. So that's part of our true history that we have to, to wrestle with. But, you know, I wish it was within my power as an individual to bring change even to just the Aboriginal deaths in custody, to just implement those recommendations. But at 2.8% of the population, we can't do that on our own. We can't do reconciliation, conciliation on our own. And so that's why we need our non-Indigenous brothers and sisters walking beside us to actually bring about the change that is needed that won't just bring healing for Aboriginal peoples, it brings healing for all our peoples and that brings hope and that's something that I want to be a part of and I hope others uh, want to be a part of as well. Very helpful. I wonder whether, so we had one question that came in earlier today, whether I wonder if I could throw it, throw it to you as well, Brooke. Um, in lots of ways, it's, it's weaving some similar themes that you've already picked up on there. But um, yeah, they really, so that they're really naming the, um, given this historically painful and destructive influence of white people and the church in particular, I guess that's the uncomfortable piece, isn't it? That we have to con kind of um, confront. Um, on Aboriginal culture and peoples, what advice do you give someone who is white and a churchgoer, a Christian, on how to just enter into conversation, build relationships with Aboriginal people? Yeah, well, one of the fascinating things is even with um, the history of colonisation and the injustices uh, that we still face today, most Aboriginal people, uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people identify as Christian. And so uh, that's an incredible power of Jesus. And uh, some of you might know um, I've helped to run uh, and coordinate the Grass Tree Gathering, uh, which is a network now of over 200 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Christian leaders who are all connected up uh, with each other across denominations and, uh, and across Australia. And for us as younger Aboriginal Christian leaders to look at those Aboriginal Christian leaders that have gone before us uh, and who are still with us. So the likes of Auntie Jean Phillips, um, of Uncle Pastor Ray Minicon, Uncle Neville Naden. Um, uh, but particularly when we look at Auntie Jean, uh, over 60 years of ministry, as she shared in the church history class that Lyndall was talking about, 60 years of ministry. Uh, and when you understand what our elders and her age group went through, you know, we're still facing injustice today, but the injustice um, for those older people uh, and still they so faithfully follow Jesus. That's a, an incredible um, example to us. And so I think it's to make sure you don't gloss over the injustices, including the injustices in the Australian church. The Australian church still has a long way to go in how to deal with systemic racism, how to respond to the fact that many churches are on original parcels of stolen land. So we can acknowledge country, but what are we going to do about the stolen land? But it's to know that it, in acknowledging the true history, there is freedom. There is freedom. The truth truly does set us free. Uh, and when we undertake that national truth telling and truth telling in community, we can be set free. Because my healing is bound up in your healing. Uh, and that's why we need each other. And, uh, you know, when we look at those population statistics, it is a miracle Aboriginal people survived. That is no one else's miracle but God's miracle. Mm -hmm. We are still here and we're still here for a reason. And we still call non-Indigenous people into relationship. 
And so it's to take that knowledge uh, into your listening and into your learning. Go on your individual journey, but what journey can you take as community? Um, and I think H3O is on a beautiful um, journey. I mean, it's incredible that you're meeting together as, as house churches and so forth uh, in this time. And so I just encourage you can, to continue that. And, you know, one of the other things I always say is whenever I speak, uh, and if people are listening, go and have a conversation this week with three other people who are not part of this community, are part of your family or your friends or your work colleagues, and go and have a conversation with three of them to continue the conversation. Um, I talked about reframing. Uh, if Aboriginal, if people have um, racist attitudes about Aboriginal people or, or just attitudes that are based in myth and stereotype, um, to bring that to the forefront, to challenge that uh, and to reframe and say, look, I listened to an Aboriginal Christian leader on Sunday who came and spoke to our church. Uh, and this is what she said, that the call on her heart was for love. What does that mean for us? Um, and so, yeah, there's so many different ways and to just keep stepping into it. What's the one thing that you could do? What's the one thing that you could do tomorrow that you could do this week, this month, this year? Uh, and to know that it is a lifelong journey. If you come on the journey with Aboriginal peoples, it's a lifelong journey. For me, that should be what our journey is as Christians. That's a lifelong journey. You never fully arrive at all of the knowledge. As Aboriginal peoples, we know we learn from our elders. You never fully arrive with all knowledge. It's a very Western thing to think about. I have to have all the knowledge. I have to have it all right, all together before I do anything. That's not the way to do this. Relationship is messy. It's complicated, but it's also beautiful and full of joy. And to so to step into that relationship. Mm -hmm. well, that is so much of it, isn't it? Just like you commented at the start, but the and it's come up a few times for people, I think, in our, our church community, but it's desire to kind of get it right. And so I'm just going to read a few more articles. I'm going to uh, just get make sure I finish First Australians before I actually step into this space. So that's such a helpful invitation to, to, to walk into the mess of this and, and just lean in. And, and yeah, there might be moments of needing to kind of correct course, but, but let's kind of get, yeah, let's step into the space to really help. And it and it's by framing it as friendship um, that, uh, you know, if things do get off course through friendship, if you are truly listening and want to be based in the relationship and the friendship, then you will find a way through. Um, when it becomes too hard, sometimes we have to walk away, uh, but it means you probably haven't listened or learnt well enough. And so it's to reflect, be very self-aware about what your journey is, what you're saying, what has been the education of your mind. How do you have to unlearn and re-educate? Uh, but that that posture of listening is is just so important. Oh, yes, yeah, that's amazing. We've got another question to throw at you, which is a bit of a different angle. Um, yeah, challenging question. Um, so firstly, thanking you. Thank you for all that you're sharing. Um, given that Aboriginal peoples are so attached to the land, and so much of that land has been taken from them. What is a good way forward? Yeah, so um, I think this NAIDOC week theme of always was, always will be, I mean, the part that's missing from that is always was, always will be Aboriginal land. Uh, we are, and, and I uh, said in a, another um, setting that always was, always will be is not a debate. And I think if people just think about that, how, what reaction do they have from those words always, was, always, will be? Um, is it one of those unsettled feelings that I was talking about before? Uh, but uh, the, the fact is it's actually part of a national truth telling. It goes back to that we are part of the creator's story and the creator created the lands and waters and placed us here as um, the creator's custodians. Uh, and so as Christians, we can think about this uh, a special way. I think um, I was asked on a Christian radio program uh, being interviewed about Black Lives Matter and they asked me, but Brooke, if we acknowledge Aboriginal people's sovereignty, what does that mean? And I actually threw it back to them and I said, well, we've never ceded sovereignty so it actually doesn't change anything because we've always have it and we always will have it because we're never going to cede it. Uh, 
obviously there's things I want to change. And so, you know, we've been calling for national things for a long time. It doesn't just start with the Uluru Statement from the heart. It goes back to 1937 and William, and all of this is on Common Grace's uh, website. We had a petition about um, truth, treaties, voice. Uh, and so there's some national work that we need to do. Uh, we, need, we are the only Commonwealth nation without a treaty or treaties with its first peoples. But Australia has made over 2,000 treaties internationally. Uh, so let's actually make a treaty with Aboriginal peoples. And in 1988, through the Barunga Statement, we were promised a treaty. Bob Hawke, the Prime Minister, then promised us a treaty. And we're still waiting today. Uh, but I actually call for one of the first steps to be a truth telling commission. And uh, it was interesting to see in the newspaper yesterday, I think, um, Victoria just announced that they would hold the first truth telling commission. But Arnie Jean and I actually held the very first one, a truth conciliation and justice commission. I based it on the models of South Africa and Canada who have been through similar processes. And so, um, you know, we had 200 people come along um, to an evening where we modelled what that would look like for Australia. And so we do need to do some of these truth tellings and that's part of it. And, um, you know, through relationship, there's many other ways that we can talk about what this means. But I think it just starts with acknowledging, um, acknowledging that our story, this story of these lands now called Australia doesn't start 250 years ago. It goes back thousands of years uh, and goes back to the creator since time immemorial. Why, why do you think we have been so slow here to... To do that why are we so behind because yeah that just seems it seems it's confusing it's hard to understand where that's gone so very wrong and there's probably all sorts of layers to that but yeah I think there I, are all sorts of layers but one of the layers and this is why I spend my time talking to Christians is that there's a spiritual layer to this uh, there's a spiritual blindness and a spiritual deafness that transcends these lands now called Australia. Um, it was the anthropologist, white male anthropologist, W.E.H. Stanner, in his 1968 Boyer Lectures uh, that coined the term the Great Australian Silence, but also he coined the term the Cult of Forgetfulness. And so it's something that in these lands now called Australia, we actually have to tune in to what's happening on a spiritual level. And when you look at the, um, the global colonial project and Black Lives Matter gives us a, a particular lens to look through, but what you're not hearing in the United States of America is in the Indigenous story that sits underneath. The, the United States of America story didn't start with slavery. Underneath slavery is the dispossession of Indigenous peoples. Underneath that layer is uh, that the Indigenous peoples of the United States of America and Canada of Turtle Island, also appointed by the creator, as the first peoples of those lands. But Australia, you know, with a colonial history going back 250 years, we're kind of at the end of this global colonial project. And 250 years isn't that long. That's only 10 generations we're talking about. And so this is something that we can actually uh, come to terms with. I call it a couple of things, reconciliation with repentance and recognition with dignity. And if people are interested to go further, uh, I've had two papers published that I co-wrote with Reverend Dr. Jeff Broughton that have just been published, reconciliation uh, without repentance and recognition without dignity and how they've led to the postponement of Indigenous justice in Australia. And that's published in Enacting a Public Theology, edited by Clive Pearson, that came out at the end of 2019. So it's tuning into the spiritual. It's mm -hmm. acknowledging that Aboriginal people can't do it on their own. Like I said before, you know, it's overwhelming for me to think that at 2.8% of the population, we're not going to influence the politicians. We've exhausted ourselves. And so we need our non-Indigenous friends to do that. And so I guess the answer to the question comes back to um, the power is in we. It's the power of we. And we do have the ability uh, to, to make the changes. Uh, but we have to want to do that. And so you and we need you in friendship to be able to do that. Really helpful. Mm. Mm. So many questions coming yeah, in now. Lots. They're all they, they took a little while and now they're all flowing. <laughs> yeah, do do yeah. Question here from Beth. Um, 
Do you feel like the way we teach Australian history in schools has evolved enough to shape the narrative of our true history for the generations of Australians coming through? Where are the gaps, do you think? Good one. Yeah, so uh, part of the problem with the current Australian curriculum is that it's kind of framed as embedding Indigenous perspectives and many of the teachers don't feel comfortable when they're non-Indigenous to embed an Indigenous perspective. Uh, I would love to see a great opportunity to employ Aboriginal people, employ our elders in the schools to actually teach the lived history. Uh, and the other thing that we need to realise is that uh, you know, it's only been in the last few years that this national curriculum has been available. And so it's going to take a whole generation when these current um, group of school students then become teachers. We're talking a whole generation. That's when we'll start to see the change through the education system. But uh, I think, you know, like I, I mentioned in the, the message about 600 police officers surrounding a statue that tells an untruth. Uh, you know, the untruths are still embedded in marble uh, all across this country. And um, that statue in particular has James Cook and says, discovered this territory. When I see that, I mean, that's part of education. When I see that and I saw it for the first time, like in Hyde Park um, about 12 months ago, I, I'd never seen that statue before because I've only been um, in Sydney a little while. Uh, but it, it took my breath away. I, I felt physically sick because what does it mean? And, you know, uh, there's still children today being taught in primary school that Captain Cook discovered Australia. Uh, we haven't really wrestled with the true history of these lands now called Australia. Um, and people can go uh, on the 29th of April, the 250th anniversary of the arrival of Cook at Cornell. Um, you can go to Common Grace's Facebook page uh, and our website also. I, I did, um, I took a moment uh, to recognise, uh, to read some of the journals of the of Cook um, and Banks and so forth um, at that site and to actually read those words but now that we know more about Aboriginal peoples um, and particularly, you know, Bruce Pascoe's Dark Emu, uh, there's still so much to go. Uh, we've still got a long journey to go. And that's why it's it's up to each one of us to try and make that difference, uh, to educate ourselves and share that education um, with others as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's certainly something I felt Um was probably actually when I heard from Auntie Jean that um, that sense of responsibility as a parent to um, to expose my kids and um, and allow them to to learn truth as well and some of the resources that we've been sharing over the week and the week to come I encourage um, those of you that have little people or um, are in relationships with little people to you know, there's some great resources there including Bruce Pascoe's Young Dark Emu. Um, even thinking about first Australians for some of our older um, school age children, um, lots of things there, lots of resources that are available um, to be able to support our kids uh, as well. And as if you, family. yeah, yeah. And if if you do have children at school, make sure you're talking to the school principal uh, and the deputy principals and their teacher. Ask them what they are teaching. Uh, you know, I, I had a conversation with a friend of mine because it's in year three that they usually learn about the stolen generations. Um, and so that's another one of the problems with the way they're being taught history. Often it's in these chunks and then they don't ever return to it. And so uh, year three, what are you, nine years old, eight years, nine years old, um, learning about the stolen generations and then you never cover it again. Uh, and so I was saying this to my friend and they're like, oh, well, our uh, – our child's in year three, they don't learn it. And then they had a conversation with their child and yes, they learn about the stolen generations. So making sure that um, for non-Indigenous families of all different cultures, that this is just part of life. Uh, don't just leave it till when you have an Aboriginal person or National Reconciliation Week or NAIDOC week, just make it a normal part of life, mm -hmm. uh, this education and uh, that you will learn from your children as well. And, and that's a beautiful thing as well. 
absolutely. The whole group was were watching In My Blood It Runs, mm. which was a really, as some of you might have might have caught it, Brooke, I don't know if you've seen it as well, but that that was a really helpful journey to go on to kind of together and watch together and then sit and talk about together. And that's another resource we're going to throw out in the in the coming weeks. Mm. And um, your Q&A, Brooke. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I did do a Q&A um, after I watched it uh, with Safina Stewart, who's one of our other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Christian leaders. Um, yeah, I mean, go and watch the Q&A. It's on the Surrender uh, website and I'm sure you'll share the link. But, um, you know, that In My Blood It Runs, we know that this is the reality. So like some of the stuff I shared in the speech, it's the reality of injustice, what's happening to our Aboriginal children in the school mm -hmm. system. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that one section where the non-Indigenous teacher is reading the Aboriginal dreaming story. Mm -hmm. What I shared this morning about what we learn as Aboriginal peoples, it is our dreaming, but the dreaming teaches you those three things, who the creator is, how to care for creation and how to live in right relationship. And then you see all those little Aboriginal kids, all those little fellas, you know, sitting around the table together, asking each other, what's their dreaming? What's your dreaming? What's your dreaming? But the teachers dismissed it as make-believe. Oh. Uh, and it's not. For us, it's the creator's story in these lands. It's a whole system of law and living. Um, you know, I wonder how people would describe Australia's whole system of law and living in one word. And that's the problem with this word, the dreaming, uh, mm. because in each of our languages, we have our own word for the dreaming. And it's a whole system of law and living passed down from the creator. And so, um, yeah, I really encourage people to watch In My Blood It Runs. Mm. Yeah, it's, a, it's such a powerful story, isn't it? And it's, and it, I don't know, just the, the main character just kind of, you're so charmed and you <laughs> you just go on this whole journey with him. He, he kind of has you right in his hand, doesn't he, as he tells you his story and you just experience a, a bit of, you know, some of the, the key chapters of his life. Um, and, I mean, his <laughs> nana, right, like I said before, yes. his nana teaching um, Aranda language, but yes. yet why isn't she in full-time employment in a school teaching yes. all children Aranda language? Uh, yes. There's so many, and that's one of the things I always say and Auntie Jean does as well, as Aboriginal peoples, we have the solutions. Mm -hmm. We just need the church and government structures to actually listen to us mm -hmm. um, and to take the action that we've been calling for for decade after decade after decade. And the film's currently available um, on to kind of catch up on as well for the rest of the month. So it's it's there. It's available mm -hmm. on ABC. So um, yeah, do 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 kind of catch that. Mm -hmm. There's lots of comments coming in. I wonder whether Linda, though, whether you just want to give us a bit of a sense of the journey that we've gone on as a as a church community as well. If people are have joined HBO in the last kind of couple of months, they may not realise that we've been on a bit of a journey with this as well. Mm -hmm. We've touched upon it there, but perhaps it's worth just throwing that in as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess yeah. There's many of us that have been. Um, on individual journeys in different ways. Um, but I think what resonated for me, Brooke, when you talk about learning in community, and I think for us at HCO, um, we haven't done that necessarily in community and corporately to, in a, like a togetherness kind of way. And we started that together really um, more explicitly at the beginning of the year as we um, gathered together on January 26 and took time to, to pause and to to reflect and to listen um, and to lament on that day along with our Aboriginal brothers and sisters. Um, and I think that that felt like a really defining moment for us um, that then led um, on lots of different wonderful paths of further reflections and learnings and sharing and discussion and mourning together and um, thinking about what does it mean as a follower of Jesus to join, to partner in, friendship in reconciliation um, and justice that is about action, um, not just about talking, not just about um, discussing together, but how do we do that with our Aboriginal brothers and sisters and how what does that look like to act? So I think that's led us to where we are now. We had intended to um, well this um, NAIDOC week, which, is, which has now been postponed obviously till, till November, but um, I think it's been amazing how God's led us on this journey. And I think there's been little offshoots of that um, and groups gathering together and learning together. And we're just, um, you know, we feel that call um, 
that that does come from Jesus, being a follower of Jesus. It does. It is about how do we participate in bringing God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven? How do we participate in pursuing shalom? And that is shalom and flourishing and wholeness for all peoples, all of his image bearers. Um, and we, um, yeah, we believe that wholeheartedly and we um, want to seek and follow Jesus in that. So, yeah, that, that's where we are. And we're just, um, yeah, delighted to have you join to join with you in that book and to have you speak into that as well. Yeah. I think we all breathed. There was a, a change heart meeting where Brooke was there too and, and we're all on our little Zoom screens and we all just breathed a sigh of relief of like, oh, it's it could be that simple when you just said, look, we were talking about how do we build relationships with, with Aboriginal peoples? How do we go on this journey? And you were like, well, we're in friendship together, so I'll just introduce you to my friends. <laughs> and I was like, oh, it's such a relief because I think we're, I was partly overcomplicating it. I was kind of thinking, how, how do we do this? How do we, how do we step into that space? And, and so, yeah, it's just been, it's been great to do it in friendship. And it's, it's great to know this is a friendship that will continue and that we've got lots of learning left to do, but we'll do it together. And yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, this is just one segment of that, isn't it, tonight? So, yeah, yeah. thank you, Brooke. Mm-hmm. yeah I am um, I'm conscious we're probably this is always is the way the questions all come in just as we go ahead it's a land out it's a landing strip but it's always it's always the way but these questions will will continue just to throw in a couple of comments that people have made that I just think might be helpful for others to hear too um, but Sue Sue chips in with um just an insight that Aboriginal culture and values strike me as very true to the teachings of Jesus we're just used to framing Jesus teaching through a western framework and um, yeah that that's really helpful isn't it it's really helpful the lens eye and I wonder whether it might be really helpful to to throw in Phil's question as well um just Brooke you will have noticed and seen all sorts of things over over um particularly recent times but what do you see as some of the positive steps um that you've noticed in in in, in the recent times that that we should be celebrating that we should be looking at as signs of hope and um yeah um for me where are the signs of hope is actually in the conversation that we're having tonight this is what brings me hope uh and it's about those individual relationships where we go deeper um uh, you know it, it it, it's a very hard time at the moment. Uh, you know, Reconciliation Australia put out, uh, you know, it's usually Aboriginal people suffer racism on average three times a week. At the moment on social media, we're experiencing it 20 times a day. So sometimes it is hard to see the hope uh, in those moments. And that's why it's this conversation tonight that actually is where I see the hope. Uh, and, uh, so I see the hope in each one of you. If just one of you changes your heart and mind to really come on the journey with us, then that is hope giving. That's hope giving to me and Aboriginal peoples, um, and hope giving to our nation. And so, um, you know, are there other steps that are happening out there? Yes, but there's still a lot of slowness. And so it's sometimes hard for me to see outside of the relationships what's actually happening. You know, like Aboriginal deaths in custody, it's so easy to implement those recommendations, but still there is not the political willpower to do so. Why? Why does it have to take so long? Um, You know, uh, people were talking about, uh, and I put it into the message, about um, the fact that one of those sacred sites was blown up by a mining company. Mm. I know which mining company. I'm not going to name them because every mining company has basically done it over many years. I've been talking about it for for the last 10 years in my Aboriginal Christian leadership journey. Uh, and so I guess the other, instead of just focusing on the hope and the positive, we need to continue to pray. Um, I feel like the last few weeks has been a wake up moment, but I actually thought our wake up moment was back in 2016. And I wrote about that and you can find it on Common Grace. Um, And I prayed for Australia to stay awake. It was when we saw a teenage Aboriginal boy in a spit hood with restraints in a chair in the Dondale Detention Centre and Four Corners did the expose. 
I thought that was Australia's wake up moment. And my fear was that Australia would go back to sleep. And Australia did go back to sleep. We've woken up again in this global moment of Black Lives Matter. But what I'm doing is I'm praying each and every day that we stay awake. We have to stay awake. We can't go back to sleep. We can't continue this cult of forgetfulness. Um, And so, uh, you know, the hope uh, is in each of you. The hope is in Jesus. And I cling so tightly to Jesus each and every day. But we have to pray together um, for change. And we actually have to take action for that change to happen. And so when I see more and more and more and more action, and that's each one of us can take action. That's what's the one thing that you could do. Um, so I probably didn't answer that uh, uh, exactly the way I would have liked, but um, uh, or what people were looking for. But you are my hope. <laughs> Jesus is my hope. And so what will we do with that hope together? Uh, and, you know, I, I often say, and there's actions in each one of these, uh, what we have to do is we have to sit together in our pain. That's your pain, my pain, our pain. We have to sit together in our pain. We have to stand together against injustice. We have to walk together in truth and friendship, and we have to pray together for change. Um, And so I hope that uh, we all keep walking together because that is hope and that will bring healing. Thank you, Brooke. Thank you. Mm. Well, we're going to ask you to to pray for us in just a moment as we we close, but just um, in true church style, remembering that we are in fact a church and this is our little notice slot. (laughs) I'm just going to just going to throw in a few little reminders. just as we as we kind of come into land if that's all right but thank you Brooke we will come back to you in just a moment and I guess firstly to say um that this is a journey that we're going on beyond the coming week and beyond that but 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 next Sunday is really a carved out time to to dive deep again into um into our theme tonight and and to do that in a bit more um I guess our immersion style is to kind of yeah to have lots of stations kind of set up and to kind of dig deep into a few of those together and to do it intergenerationally mm-hmm. and learn from each other um, and to reflect so so that is happening next Sunday so do yeah just sign up get involved come come along to one of the house church um, options there'll be one in the evening um, and there'll be um, some in the morning so just sign up to the one that's going to work best for you and, and the people in your household um, and we'd love to invite you to come and and yeah come and lean in um, and go on that journey um, that Brooks just described there and um, we're also just to say we're really we're really excited that um, we're exploring what it looks like to financially support our friends at Common Grace and so again we'd love your thoughts on that and and do come and grab us and let us know what, what you think about that and we hope that that will be, be something that we can um, have in place uh, in the coming kind of weeks and months and um, that's that's yeah, that's there. There are our, our friends that we've journeyed with for some time and are supporting us hugely as we, um, yeah, as we as we kind of lean in as we explore further. So we're excited to, to do that in a more formal way in the coming months. Mm. And then just to flag as well, um, you will have heard um, you saw our little video about our new venue, and there's been lots of other little videos appearing. I think Jan and Dan in the car park was the most recent one, um, but um, some more exciting little revelations to come. But we are hoping to be in the PCYC and the plan was was August um, but just with um, the situation particularly in, in Victoria um, things have slowed down a little bit and some of the guidelines are perhaps not um, moving quite as fast as we thought they would. We're really keen to gather as um, in, in our community as, as in a HBO kind of way so with food, with singing um, and, and without some of the restrictions that are still in place. So we're just keeping a little eye on that and we'd love your thoughts too. So there'll be a little survey that'll go out um, in the week ahead. Um, so, so do let us know what you think. We want to get that decision right. We, we sense that it's right to probably push it back a little bit um, and, and be able to gather um, in the way that, um, that, that kind of feels like us. Um, so we, we may well need to just push it a little bit. Love your thoughts. And we'll be sending a survey about that in, in the coming days. So look out for that. Uh, and do let us know what you think. Your, your opinions really matter to us as we, as we kind of journey and try and get this right. Um, it's been great to meet in House Church. Uh, it's been great to be able to do 
um, to gather as we did this morning and to do things a bit differently and to have the freedom to do that. So, uh, so come on that journey with us. We'll certainly be doing it for the next few weeks and, and possibly a little bit further than we first thought. Um, but we're excited to gather together. It's going to be so good, isn't it? Um, to gather together in person um, when, we, when we do, when the time is right. So um, that's all to come. Yeah. And just to add too, in the, in the coming week as we head towards our immersion, as we've done this last week, there'll be a lot more resources dropping into your Facebook feeds as well, some of which we've been talking about tonight. So please do keep your eye open for that. Again, um, we've tried to um, think about a spread of different resources for across the age span. So check those out. Tell us what you think. Um, and, yeah, we can continue this learning together as well. Wonderful. Well, if that's okay, Brooke, we'll hand back to you to, to kind of really just send us out. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. And um, if I could just add, uh, with Common Grace, um, uh, I'm sure you all know the website is commongrace.org.au, but specifically in the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander justice uh, area, uh, as Common Grace, we are led by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Christian leaders to pursue friendship and reconciliation in our lifetime. Uh, you know, through my leadership and uh, in partnership with the Grass Tree Gathering, Common Grace does amplify the voices of Aboriginal Christian leaders right across these lands now called Australia. So if you want to hear from other peoples, please go and check out uh, Common Grace. We've got on our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Justice page, there's theological resources, church resources, prayer resources, uh, a Get Educated section. So there's so much on our website that uh, myself and others have accumulated over the last five years and it's a, a place to start. So um, please do check out Common Grace and looking forward to as we continue to explore partnership um, between Common Grace and H3O. And so uh, thank you so much for having me uh, here tonight. Um, so I'm going to pray um, and then I'm going to finish with a blessing. And this blessing is actually on the Common Grace website as well. It's one that I wrote. So let me pray for us uh, tonight. Great Creator Spirit, Lord God, Papa, Jesus, I just thank you for the community of H3O. We just sit in the fact that it is community, a community that you have brought together, that you have woven together, and of which I have been woven into tonight. I thank you that we have been able to share together, uh, to listen together, to learn together, and to continue to walk together. I pray for each individual who has tuned in today and who is part of the H3O uh, community. I pray for those individuals across all the generations. I pray for the individual communities of house churches that have gathered, and I pray for the overall community. I pray that you continue to unsettle in heart, mind, and spirit. Uh, unsettle each individual and uh, each of those different communities and H3O as a whole uh, to unsettle in heart, mind, and spirit, uh, to wrestle, uh, to be curious, to wonder about who you are, the great mystery of you, uh, creator, Holy Spirit, Jesus. Uh, we pray that that leads to a journey of justice. Uh, please help each person um, and in community to work out what the steps are, what is the one thing they could do uh, to take a step for you, Jesus, a step for justice, a step for healing, a step for hope. And as we pray about walking together and about stepping and journeying, we pray for the day that we can run together as Aboriginal peoples and non-Aboriginal peoples in these lands now called Australia. Jesus, you are our hope. And so we stand firm in that hope tonight as part of this community. I thank you for H3O, uh, for each individual, for the leadership and the community. And I pray uh, that you continue to do the amazing work uh, of you in this community. So in your almighty and precious name, Jesus. Amen. Mm -hmm.